disciplinary matters and folks can join as needed. So again, thank you for uh, for joining this, the, uh, the kickoff to the 100% RPS study. Um, uh, yeah, virtual virtual work group. As I said, we've got about 30, approximately 30 people on the roster list. I know that there were some other complicating things that came on the schedule, so not everybody will be joining. Uh, but as Rebecca indicated, we'll be recording the meeting, so you know we'll put it out to other folks that didn't get a chance to join that they can catch up and uh, hopefully view the whole presentation and then provide comments based on what they hear um, um, later on. So given that we have so many people on the call, I didn't want to go through um, introductions uh, with everybody. I think that would be too time consuming, but we will uh, send around or post a list of attendees after the meeting. Uh, but as we go through this and there are questions that come up, if you're called to speak, please just give your name and uh, who you're with or what you're representing. And, uh, and so that'll make it easier. And, and once folks you know, begin to identify you, then it'll be hopefully less uh, formal and uh, there'll be good recognition across the group. Um, I think at the outset, Rebecca indicated that everybody would be muted. So you'll have to turn on your microphone when you make a comment. And then I would just say, you know, once that's done or you're finished with the discussion, then please go back on mute so that we uh, avoid any unnecessary disruption um, through the proceeding. Um, so just at the outset, just uh, basic introductions. I'm Fred Kelly with Power Plant Research Program. Um, I've been with the program for nine years. I'm currently serving as acting director um, for, uh, well, for maybe about a month more. Um, uh, supporting this, I've got, um, of course, Kevin Porter and Rebecca Wittes, who you already heard from from Exeter. They will be the um, the 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 veterans of this effort, uh, they uh, be, I'll be relying on them uh, in, in to, to work through this presentation is to, to carry the load primarily on the um, on the the, uh, the RPS study. And then, of course, we've got uh, the vibrant clean energy team. I'll let them um, I'll let them go ahead and introduce themselves when they uh, when they come up to, uh, to bat, so to speak. They've got a um, uh, looks to be a very um, uh, uh, large presenta presentation, a lot of information there, but um, uh, they've got some preliminary information that in introduces themselves at the bat. Um, but anyway, and then uh, as we go through the uh, presentations, we'll uh, we'll have uh, breaks, I guess, at, at each interval and uh, see if there are any questions. But yeah, if you can hold off on, uh, as I said, there's a lot of material here. So if you can hold off on questions, that'll be great um, until until the break. But um, but also, is there a um, sorry I didn't get to this. Is there a chat box? Oh, there is a raise hand function. And um, so if you do have a question, maybe uh, pin that on to sh uh, to raise hand to uh, to notify that you want to you have a question. And then yes, there is a chat box function over there on the right, um, so that if you have do have a question, you want to start to pose it right away. Please do so. Um, there. Um, and then, uh, yeah, with, re with respect to questions, hopefully we can answer everything uh, on this two hour, the two hours we've allotted today. But if there are things that we don't get to or, or we need a little bit of a deeper dive, we'll also summarize those and uh, maybe a post follow up um, as um, um, and, and you'll see we have some uh, recourse for providing comment and follow up. So we'll get to that. Um, and, uh, and I'll just say, yeah, thanks for joining this uh, virtual meeting. And um, this thing, I think it'll go on uh, for, you know, on the order of a year or so. And, and maybe there's the there's potential for an in-person meeting uh, in the future somewhere. I know we've kind of covered this in uh, PPRAC, the Power Plant Research Advisory Committee meeting. Uh, I remember um, uh, participating in one of those more, of, more as a, um, just a visit, uh, as a spectator, but uh, Maybe that's in the future. And uh, so with that, is there, are, before we start, uh, switch to the next slide, any preliminary questions up front? Uh, nothing of technical matter, but in terms of how you're viewing things or any, um, any questions related to how we're hosting this? So that's good. <laughs> okay, let's um, go to the next slide. And so, 
So this is, um, yeah, today's presentation to kick this off. I'm uh, providing the um, study overview, again, Power Plant Research Program, Fred Kelly. Um, and uh, as we go through this, um, yeah, if, um, in turn, uh, I'm providing the study overview. We'll have the work plan and schedule uh, to be covered by uh, Kevin um, and, uh, and Rebecca. And so um, that'll um, that'll take us up to, I think the brunt of the um, presentation is the uh, vibrant clean energy, the model, a lot of the information that they've uh, put together and uh, how they will approach this, this uh, primarily modeling exercise uh, for for addressing this, uh, this question. And then uh, the assumptions and key inputs will be the much more, um, I guess, providing, uh, you know, trying to get comment on, on how we go forward. I think at the at the outset, as we'll discuss, there's you know it's all model driven, scenario based, and we'll need a lot of input from the uh, the work group as to how we uh, how we po I guess pose the problem and 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 run the models to uh, to try to get the answers that we're we're seeking. And then at the close of it, we'll have some uh, next steps. So next slide, please. The study scope, uh, the um, what we're here for is uh, came from the Clean Energy Jobs Act. It's looking for 100% uh, uh, renewable energy or uh, or clean energy. Uh, the you know, both of those, uh, the one based purely on renewables and then also clean that also factors in uh, nuclear. Um, it was uh, came from the Clean Energy Jobs Act of 2019. So uh, as that came through, there was also some understanding that. Uh, there may have been some overlap with the previous Maryland RPS study, which many of you, I'm sure, participated in. So it's all very familiar to you. So in, in a sense, the uh, the correspondence with uh, State Senator Brian Feldman mentioned there had to do with, uh, I guess, which, which areas that we might uh, touch on again so that we're not duplicative in a sense, uh, you know, making, uh, making an unnecessary uh, effort in some areas. Uh, so, so the, in a sense, we'll redo selected portions of the Maryland RPS study that PPRP submitted to the General Assembly in December 2019, um, assess the cost and benefits of the 100% RPS and 100% clean energy standard by 2040. Again, my understanding, and, I, and, and to be candid up front, I haven't been that involved in this thing, so I'm looking forward to uh, learning a lot on this and hopefully to become fluent in, in all aspects of this topic in short order. But, um, but certainly um, Kevin, um, Kevin and, and Rebecca, and I'm sure the uh, Vibrant Clean Energy team are you know, well suited to answer all the questions and provide the technical material and understanding as needed. But anyway, RPS, uh, wind, solar, um, and getting into clean energy, which, which factors into nuclear or other, um, I guess, zero carbon, carbon energy forms. Um, and then uh, other aspects of the, uh, the scope that we'll cover is you know, determining which industries and communities will be positively, negatively impacted by, uh, by implementing this, um, by implementing the RPS, 100% uh, RPS, and then design mechanisms to alleviate any negative impacts for affected workers and communities. Um, recommendations to change the R Maryland RPS or recommendations for incorporation into future proposals for uh, Maryland clean energy standard. So that's a lot there. I guess that's the um, that's what the point that we're trying to get to uh, on the recommendations. So um, next slide, please. So the uh, the working group as it uh, came together today, um, its membership, it's got um, as as before utilities. Uh, PJM representation, uh, renewable energy developers. I think we have a, maybe the biggest group, uh, energy companies, industry groups, citizens, um, a handful of those, and then state agencies, MDE, um, and then counties. I know Baltimore, Prince George's County um, indicated an interest in joining on this. And uh, so we have a, a broad, um, I think a, a broad base to, to form our, our study work group here. Uh, and the role of the working group is to uh, provide feedback on the scenarios that we're putting together. I think what we'll dis discuss today gets into the baseline scenarios and, uh, and forecasts what we'll be doing in terms of schedule, taking uh, new scenarios on sensitivities iter iteratively, but uh, the, the primary role is to provide input so that we're covering the spread in terms of how we look at this 100% uh, this RPS study. Um, as far as process goes, 
Um, yeah, we will, uh, as we did for this one, we'll provide the presentations in advance. So get people thinking about um, the, you know, the information that's going to be presented and have questions and hopefully have uh, uh, a broad discussion um, um, while we're while we're here and not after the fact. Uh, we'll have these live input working group meetings and uh, primarily, yeah, we'll be open to having follow-up comments at the, um, as we go forward on this. And, um, and documentation, you know, we'll provide all of this information on PPRP's website. Uh, we've provided the web link there and, uh, and, and primarily, yeah, I'll serve as the primary point of contact on this. Uh, so if anybody has any questions or follow-up on technical matters or anything, please uh, send them to me and I will uh, either provide an answer or I'll find somebody who does have the answer and um, and and we'll um, we'll go forth in that in that way I'll be the gatekeeper for uh, getting the information across to uh, the technical folks that need to look at it and respond but uh, but again yeah thank you for uh, taking the time out uh, sharing your expertise and perspectives and uh, and I yeah truly believe that uh, you know, your input is very vital into making this a robust final report as indicated there. So um, with that, I think I'll be handing it over. I think we go to the next slide, um, but is there any question on that part of the presentation for me up front? And uh, yeah, and at the conclusion of this, I think I mentioned that we will summarize who was on the call today and provide that list of uh, folks. Um, so in lieu of going through all, you know, introductions of everybody here, I think we have a broad representation of folks, but please, as we go through this, and if you do uh, speak up, just state your name and who you're with. Uh, so with that, I'll um, turn it over to you, um, Kevin and Rebecca. Okay, uh, can everyone hear me? This is Rebecca. Yeah? Yes, Rebecca. Oh, great. Sounds good. Okay, so um, yes, indeed, I'm at Exeter Associates. I've been with Exeter, I think, for eight years now. And um, I know many of you from past work we've done for PPRP, so it's exciting to get a chance to work with everyone again. Um, and I'm looking forward to interacting with the new folks. Uh, and as this slide suggests, I'm just going to take you on a quick tour of our work plan. Um, it's pretty high level, so I don't think anybody is going to be shocked. Um, as you know, the CJA, the questions posed by the CJA, um, they will require modeling. And this time we'll be using Vibrant Clean Energy's Wisdom model, which is both a capacity expansion model and production cost model. Uh, this slide is really just a sneak preview of the next presentation. We're lucky to have two representatives from VCE with us. Obviously, they know a lot more than I do about how the model works, so I'm going to leave it uh, to them to walk you through it. Uh, just as with the last modeling project we did with PPRP, which was the long-term electricity report, uh, we'll be looking at initial scenarios that kind of give us the sort of basic view of um, what we've been asked to model, uh, which is the 100% RPS or 100% CARES by 2040. And as always, we want to be able to contrast that with business as usual, which is today's uh, suite of policies, uh, most prominently the 50% RPS by 2030. Um, and then once we are comfortable with those results, we'll be circling back with all of you to talk about what sensitivity scenarios we should run in order to look at how uh, the model is affected by key assumptions. Um, this is not the focus of today's presentation, the sensitivity scenarios, but uh, we just thought we'd throw in some of the ones that have already bubbled up in conversation. Um, Obviously, we'll be making some assumptions about the cost of renewables, and sometimes those tend to, or they can be, um, a little high, so we could look at a low-cost scenario. Um, since we're looking at current policies, we're not looking at high electrification of the sort that um, would be needed for some of the um, swift decarbonization um, proposals that are out there. So that's another sensitivity scenario. 
Biden has proposed a national clean energy standard, but it's not on the books. So that's something we could look at. Um, there are different models for how climate change may impact the weather and electricity use. So we could choose to model one um, of the more severe scenarios. We could look at what happens when we're not able to put in as much transmission as might be cost effective. Um, in the real world, this is often a sort of political challenge, but in the model that gets accomplished by making the cost of transmission um, exorbitantly high. We could look at what would happen if the states around us also raise the bar in terms of um, shooting for high renewables or high clean energy. And uh, depending what happens in our standard scenarios, we could look at changing what happens uh, with Calvert Cliff, which obviously um, is a huge contribution to our clean energy production in state. Uh, this slide is very short and simple because we really want to drive home the very first bullet. And I'm going to hand the microphone over to Kevin, who feels very passionately about this bullet point. Uh, okay, <laughs> this is Kevin Porter, and uh, thank you. Um, yeah, we we have uh, funding to do 20 scenarios, and those of you who followed uh, the work we did in a long-term electricity report know that we did more than that, particularly with the first one, uh, which I think we did as many as 45. Um, so, um, and because we're actually kind of um, looking at both 100% renewables and 100% clean, um, we have really a limited set of sensitivities that we can do. Um, so I, I just want to, I want to caution people when they think about other things we should be looking at because we really uh, are constrained somewhat in how much we can look at. Um, I do want to just reiterate or emphasize that the sensitivity um, scenarios that Rebecca spoke about in the previous slide, uh, we have not committed to any of them. These are just ideas. Um, once we do the initial model runs with the base case, 100% clean, 100% renewables, we will look at the results, come up with some ideas of possible sensitivities to look at, and then come back to the working group and, and um, get your feedback or reaction to those. So, uh, so that's my passionate spiel for the day. If people have any um, reactions, responses, by all means, um, We'd be happy to hear them. Okay, I'm taking the virtual microphone back. Uh, so we will focus on the modeling first. Uh, then once we have a feel for what kind of um, renewable or clean energy deployment might be on the horizon, given X, Y, or Z scenario, we'll do input output modeling to look at the jobs and other economic impacts of that development. Um, and then we'll also think about, um, as required, any mechanisms that we can recommend for mitigating negative community and employment impacts. We actually will be starting on this second bullet um, now in terms of benchmarking all the work that's being done in the field. Um, there's a lot of interest in mitigating negative impacts, both at the state and the federal levels. So um, if you know of great resources and you want to send them our way, um, please feel free to do that sooner than later. Well, Rebecca, we have one question. Oh, good. What is it? I can't... Alex Pavlak? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Alex. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Alex Pavlak. I'm the chairman of the Future of Energy Initiative, one of the uh, citizens in your work group. Uh, the question is for Kevin Porter here. The, I think this is a very fundamental question in terms of uh, uh, what you're doing. Are we talking about 100% RPS? or 100% renewables. Um, as an engineer, I'm taught that any system analysis needs a defined boundary. And a uh, reasonable defined boundary here is the state of Maryland. Uh, if we, if Maryland was to generate all of its electricity uh, that it consumes within state, that would be 100% renewables for the state of Maryland. Um, 
Likewise, if you were talking about nuclear, you would uh, look at uh, generating all of your nuclear in state. That would be 100% nuclear for the state of Maryland. Now, the RPS is different. The RPS assumes that uh, uh, any uh, wrecks that are uh, sold uh, are counted against electricity consumed within a political entity, uh, regardless of where the wrecks are generated. So we're paying for wrecks in North Dakota and other parts of the PJM system. Uh, I understand uh, there's a, a, an effort or a desire to constrain this to the PJM system. But in that case, what you're really talking about here, or what you're calling a 100% RPS, is really a 7% PJM system. Uh, Maryland consumes 7% of the uh, uh, energy consumed within PJM. So what are we talking about here? Is, uh, I think the public really needs to see 100% renewables. What does it take to uh, generate all of the electricity consumed by Maryland within the boundaries of Maryland? Uh, but that's not what is uh, interpreted here as 100% RPS. Uh, what is it? Is it 100% renewables and 100% RPS? That's uh, my question. Uh, thanks, Alex, for the question. Um, it's, uh, and you're right, I, I could have been a little more precise in describing this. Um, it's 100% RPS. We are assuming that the Clean Energy Jobs Act of 2019 uh, would be in place, and then it would be, we'll have a slide on this later, it would be uh, ramped up in 5% increments between 2030 and 2040. If I got my math right. Well, in any events, we'll, we'll show the slide. It will go from 50% to 100% um, by 2040. And so all the eligibility that's in the current Maryland RPS statute, in other words, if you're in PJM or if you're an outside PJM can be transmitted in, that's what we'll be looking at now. I mean, said that, I know a, you know, a possible sensitivity to look at is how would you physically meet 100% renewables or inside Maryland? That's a possible sensitivity to look at if um, it is desired to do so. Um, but in any event, Alex, I hope that answers your question. If you have a follow up, by all means, please weigh in. Yeah, this, uh, I regard this as really a fundamental issue that may be beyond our pay grade. I mean, this is, uh, you know, uh, assuming the uh, Clean Energy Jobs Act is the boundary of this study. Uh, well, that, you know, that, that limits uh, what you're really looking at for the study. And you've got some fundamental assumptions here about what is everybody else on the PJM system doing. Mm -hmm. if, uh, uh, if everybody is doing nothing, then 100% RPS is really great. If uh, everybody else on the system is doing the same thing, then 100% RPS is the same as a 100% Maryland study. Mm -hmm. So th this is not something I think we should gloss over. I think, uh, if anything, we ought to go back to uh, our political masters and ask for uh, for some feedback here. Well, so we did say as what possible sensitivity to look at is a high renewables requirement in PJM uh, more broadly. Um, I'm purposely being vague there because I don't know if that would be 100% PJM wide or 50% PJM wide and 100% in Maryland. I just, I haven't really thought that through, um, but that is you know, one way to, to look at that. Um, but at least for purposes of determining, you know, a starting place, you know, we're assuming CJA and then ramping that up to 100%, at least for the RPS part of this study. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm, I don't want to cut Alex off here, so. Well, no, I, I think we've defined our position, or I, I understand your position. Uh, I don't agree with it. I think it's uh, very easy to meet the 100% RPS requirement, and it's very difficult to if you if everybody is doing the same thing, or you're trying to meet a uh, 
uh, a 100% renewables requirement within the state of Maryland. There's an enormous difference between the feasibility of the two approaches. And that's kind of fundamental to this whole project. And uh, I think, uh, uh, I, I don't think they, you know, I don't, I come from the engineering background. I want to build clean systems, and I don't think you're going to get there by uh, uh, with the 100% um, renewables definition. But uh, I think we've identified the conflict, and we can move on. Okay. Okay. Thanks, thanks Alex. Okay. Uh, okay. So, just as we're doing, we're vetting the standard scenarios and input assumptions with you all in August. Um, and then we'll be looking to make model runs once we pin down those key inputs. In September and October, we'll take a look at those model runs in-house, make sure they make sense to us and with PPRP, and then we'll bring the results to you all um, and get your feedback and rerun the model as necessary. Uh, then starting around November, we're looking to dive into the sensitivity scenarios, as Kevin was saying, um, and vet the plan with you all, um, and then the input assumptions associated with the various scenarios, and finally, the model run results. Um, so we want to be engaged with you along the way. Um, and one thing I didn't say early on is that um, for anyone who's not terribly familiar with Maryland's RPS or the CARES Act. Um, they are sort of outlined and specific in the appendix. We just figured um, based on the composition of this work group that most people are very aware of each of those um, ideas. And so we didn't want to spend too much time dwelling on them. Uh, okay, so we're thinking around January, we'll finish the sensitivity cases. Um, and share those with the work group. Uh, February, we run them as necessary. And by March, hopefully we'll be finished with the modeling and moving on to the other aspects of the project. Um, that gives us quite a bit of time to uh, shift over to input output modeling and begin drafting the report. Uh, the final report is not technically due to uh, the General Assembly or the governor. I can't remember which it's technically due to until January 2024, uh, but we're hoping it doesn't take that long, um, both for the sake of our budget and also for the sake of it being a useful study that people can um, review the findings and run with them. Uh, that's my last slide. So does anyone else have questions on sort of the big picture uh, schedule that we've laid out? A quick question. This is Jenna Christensen Lewis. Yeah, I recognize your voice. <laughs> Thanks. I'm a member of the public participating. Um, when you're assessing the cost and benefits, you are going to assess the impact on people's rates, their rate bills, I assume. Is that correct? That is a good question. I think we might need to extrapolate that from the model in order to get there, but we did do that in the past for the RPS report. Um, so it's a really good point. And um, if that's not the case, I'll circle back. Thank you. Okay. Next up, we have the team from VCE, and uh, we're going to try to shift uh, to them controlling the forward arrow since they have quite a few slides. So that might take us a minute. All right, I'll give this a go, Rebecca, from my side. How does that look for folks? Looks That's good. Pretty. All right, cool. And it sounds like you can hear me too. So thank you. Thank you everyone for being here today. Thank you for the kind introductions so far. Um, we're excited to be able to be working on this project with Maryland. I'm Brianna Cote. I'm an energy data analyst here at Vibrant Clean Energy. 
on the call as well as my colleague Aditya, who will help me present to you today. Chris Clack, our founder, is out on family emergency medical leave, unfortunately. Um, he sends both his regrets and his regards. Any questions that Aditya and I cannot answer that do require Chris, we'll reach out to him and, and get you those answers as quickly as we can. Uh, we're a company located in North Boulder, Colorado, and uh, we have several, several shared purposes and goals um, with our optimization modeling all together. We aim to reduce the cost of electricity and help evolve economies to reduce emissions. We like data, and so we, we handle a large data sets across the board, things that impact the grid as a whole to co-optimize with um, those costs I just mentioned. Um, we'll go through some of those data sets today. We aim to increase the understanding of variable renewable generation because that can change greatly based upon the time frames and the space that you're looking at. We also aim to agnostically determine the least cost portfolio mix throughout the various scenarios that we model. We worked with several different en uh, energy agencies. Um, uh, an example of some ISOs, we worked with MISO. Our report is recently available to review on our website. An example of some cooperatives we worked with was here in Colorado, Holy Cross and Intermountain Rural Electric Association. They were trying to determine whether to go into the KISO EIM market or the SPP market, and we aim to help them with that. We worked with the, Uni the University of Texas recently doing deep decarbonation studies in that state. That involved uh, novel technologies, including hydrogen and even direct air capture. Above and beyond that, we've, uh, we've worked with various nonprofits and advocates as well. This is our team. We are small, we are four people. You have Aditya and myself on the call today. Chris and Sarah started the company in 2015 and Aditya and I have been on board for the last two, three years about. I won't go into the details of what we do or um, our histories and backgrounds, but if you have any questions, do feel free to follow up. Um, we're happy to do so. So here at VCE, we offer several tools and data sets. Um, one of our main offerings in particular is our wisdom optimization models and all its variants. For this project, we'll be using our wisdom P, which is the full planning version and our flagship model. This is our bread and butter. It is our most robust model that we offer. We have other variants that aim to target more specific applications. As an example, Wisdom B um, is the base load generation version where we provide the model a base load that it needs to hit and fill with, say, wind, solar, and storage only. And then there's output statistics from that. That will eventually be open source, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to mention it today. These other variants are more specific. Wisdom P is, is the most wide scale and robust that we offer. As a part of our optimization modeling, we have to handle and build up large data sets that help to form them. This includes weather, transmission, uh, input generators, climate data, the list goes on and on. But we also offer those as an aside if people just want that data altogether for their own applications. I wanna stress a little bit more on the weather and power data sets here, because this is also our bread and butter here at VCE. We have several years at very high resolution, three kilometer, five minutely weather data um, for the past eight going on nine calendar years. Further back than that, we, we, have, um, uh, we have even further back than that, more weather data as well, but the granularity does get a little bit less, both spatially and temporally. The reason I wanted to call this out in particular is this is also a big, um, big portion of our bread and butter offering and that it lays the foundation for so much of what wisdom does whether innately impacts the grid and understanding that more completely um, not only helps in the variable generation realm, but with so much else as well. With that, I'll hand it over to Aditya to discuss um, Wisdom P modeling setup altogether. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so Wisdom P is a fully customizable uh, capacity expansion and production cost model. Uh, the model can uh, iterate over several investment periods at uh, customized resolution, uh, ranging from yearly to several years at a time. Uh, the model allows all kinds of technologies to compete with one another uh, in order to uh, determine the lowest cost system. 
the generation build out rates are constrained by historical data as well as supply chain constraints. Uh, the model has a DER subroutine, which I'll talk about in a little bit. The model also allows uh, various sectors to uh, couple as well as uh, co optimize within the model. Uh, we model the storage and transmission explicitly. And determining and uh, de uh, depending on the resolution required, the model uh, works in an inner outer method methodology similar to a weather model, where the outer run is a coarser run, which provides boundary conditions to a, a higher resolution inner run, uh, which helps improve our solve times and get uh, higher resolution results out very quickly. Uh, next slide, please. So here are a few uh, characteristics of the model. I'm not going to all of them. The main ones are the model can co-optimize transmission, generation, uh, uh, storage, and distributed resources. Uh, the transmission is resolved all the way down to 69 kilovolts, while the generation siting is resolved down to three kilometer resolution. Uh, the dispatch the model of the model can be performed up at a uh, resolution of five minute. Um, in addition to that, the demand flexibility is uh, tied to weather data. So the model cannot cheat and, uh, for example, uh, up, up dispatch heating when there is no heating demand, for example. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of generation, the model includes all thermal generation uh, and all kinds of VRE generation, such as uh, onshore wind, offshore wind, uh, distributed solar, which includes rooftop and community solar, uh, as well as utility scale solar. Uh, we also include novel technologies such as carbon capture and sequestration, enhanced geothermal and small modular reactors, as well as molten salt reactors. The transmission, as we discussed, is uh, resolved down to 69 kilovolts and uh, includes both overhead and underground lines, as well as HVDC. Uh, the model also includes hydrogen production, direct air capture, uh, Haber process for ammonia production, saboteur and fissure drops for synthetic fuels. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a little bit of about the distribution co-optimization. Uh, the model uh, fully resolves uh, and explicitly models the utility scale generation, which we see on the left side of the figure here. And we define utility scale as anything above 69 kilovolt transmission. The distribution system is parameterized within the model and all the impacts of distrib uh, distributed resources uh, uh, and their costs and benefits are modeled through this parameterization and that's below the 69 kilovolt. So, for example, distributed resources such as uh, rooftop solar or community solar can help shave load peaks uh, and reduce costs while at the same time over generation can create backflow and increase costs. Distributed storage can help mitigate the backflow. Uh, issues, but increases O&M costs in the distribution system. So therefore, the model through this parameterization is able to uh, quantify the value and uh, costs of these uh, distributed resources and thus is able to co-optimize those with the utility scale generation. Next slide, please. Here's a quick example of that in work. Um, uh, what we see on the left side here is the full dispatch and whereas on the right side the two panels show in gray uh, the part portion of the dispatch coming from the utility scale generation so when the distribution co-optimization is turned off which is in the top two uh, panels we see that the utility scale generation has to ramp up and down to ensure it meets load and thus it's a little bit non-optimal in terms of uh, operation whereas in the bottom two panels you see that the distributed resources uh, when the co-optimization is turned on, the distributed resources shift load to ensure a smoother uh, load as seen by the utility scale generation, which increases the load factor as seen by the utility scale generation and helps uh, in, uh, results in a more uh, effective operation of the utility grid and reduces cost. So that's just an example of what the DR co-optimization can help with. Um, with that, I'll hand it back to Bree to talk about our data sets. Um, this is Rebecca. There was a question related to that slide, so I just wanted to um, flag it. It's over in the chat. Uh, it's from Erica Bannerman, and she asks, how is utility scale defined by generation capacity? Uh, good question. So, uh, utility scale is anything that's uh, uh, connected to uh, a 69 kilovolt node or above. 
in some cases, yes, uh, when it is not clear through our data set, we do rely on uh, the size, especially for solar, to determine whether it's a utility scale or a distributed uh, uh, generator. Yeah, and that'll be important for some of the updates that we're doing, um, the customization, particularly for our input generated data sets. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So if that question persists, um, we can totally touch base again. And yeah, this is Kevin. We got yet yeah, another question uh, about microgrids, um, how microgrids are being considered or incorporated. And then I'd yeah. actually like to take the opportunity before you answer that, I'm sorry, Aditya, no, 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 um, no. to throw open the floor for other questions, because um, this is a pretty lengthy and meaty presentation. I want to give people a chance uh, sure. to ask some questions part way through. So, Absolutely. Can you, I'm sorry, go ahead. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, uh, it's a good question. Um, so, the distribution co optimization, uh, we can uh, basically tweak the parameters uh, in the distribution co optimization. Uh, so, currently, in what we presented, uh, the the distribution grid is co-optimized and considered on equal footing to the utility grid, but uh, we have parameters which we can tweak to make the uh, model think of it them as microgrids. Uh, so yes, uh, we can uh, uh, definitely do that in the model. If there are any more questions, I can answer them or hand it back to Bree. Yes, Alex. Yeah. About yeah um, sorry about this slow pickup here. Uh, yeah, I. I'm an engineer. If I make a mistake, I have a liability associated with that. So I check my models. I uh, run test cases. I validate the models every way I can. And uh, I see that in the uh, wind industry with the day ahead forecasters. They do a, a very good job of validating their model, tweaking them with empirical coefficients to uh, predict uh, next day uh, uh, next day wind power because there's money associated with that. I don't see much attention given to the uh, system models in that regard. Um, NREL just published an LA100 study and we attempted to validate their models by uh, uh, asking the question if you take their system configuration, could they satisfy the actual load for 2018 to 2020 using actual generation profiles and it was bad. Um, LA and California every December they have a three week period of low wind and low sun it's completely missed by the NREL models. And the NREL models tend to seem to smooth the data out and make intermittent generation appear to be more reliable than it really is. Now, from what I've seen of wisdom, uh, you guys are better than us. You're using actual data on wind, but I still don't see the validation. Uh, what I'd like to see is uh, something like uh, take ERCOT, take the actual load for a five year period or three year period or whatever, and apply your model against, uh, you know, they, they, they know where well documented renewable assets uh, take their renewable assets. Can you reproduce what it actually produced? Because that which leads you to things like, oh my gosh, we have a wind load correlation here that's really driving things that's not included in our model. Uh, now, my interpretation is my belief based on what I've read is that you really have a theoretical model here that it really hasn't been validated to the level normally associated with engineering models and uh, which means there's an inherent risk in terms of the predictions and I was wondering if you could comment on that. Okay, so absolutely. So we do uh, validate every aspect of the model. So when it comes to uh, the wind and solar profiles, uh, we have done some studies which uh, validates our generation profiles against actual uh, wind farm generation, for example. And uh, it's a, it's, it was part of the MISO uh, report, uh, which we can send to the group here. Uh, and we uh, show that our uh, uh, estimates of wind power production match up. So, we, uh, so that's the, uh, basically the inputs, the matching of the inputs. When it comes to the Wisdom B model, 
every modeling exercise starts out with a validation. So we first start with, uh, so for example, in this scenario, we would start with 2020 and uh, the model would actually recreate 2020 based on the existing input generation, uh, existing transmission, everything. And the model has to be able to recreate 2020 as it was. So uh, every model run inherently has uh, first a reproduction of uh, the first uh, investment period, the starting period, and after that, the model uh, marches forward in capacity expansion. Great, great. I'd like to see that if you could send the, something out like the MISO. I know does a pretty good job on this. If you've been in, involved with MISO, I'd like to see what you you've done in terms of validation. Definitely, yes, we will send that to the group. Thanks. Yeah. And uh, I just want to add another quick thing. Uh, as part of that, every model run, the first investment period, uh, which we use for our validation, uh, it has to satisfy not only load, uh, but also has to ensure it meets all the NERC PRM uh, criteria, as well as 7% load following reserve. So we ensure that the model is actually doing as, uh, ensuring that the model is working as was planned. Uh, yeah, actually, yeah, so. Yeah, no loss of load at any time, essentially, because sometimes you can remove specific hours and that can change things really greatly because um, those are the hard times. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's the, the, the outliers that really kill you here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, exactly. And just to know, as you mentioned, we do use weather data that's actually been experienced across uh, the U.S. essentially. And so um, we've done a little bit of, it's more internal work, but um, ERCOT earlier this year, um, when they went through that February freeze, we did a look at how things performed then as well. Um, mm -hmm. We we don't, I, like I said, it's more internal, but I'll see if there's anything that could be shared there too. That'd be great. Thank you. Any other questions? You know, we'll, we'll have more time for questions and probably the, the following slides will bring up new questions as well. Okay, I hear it. Is that better at all? Sorry. People yeah, were saying yeah. I'm a bit quiet. Yeah, so. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, cool. Yeah. Thank you for that. <laughs> All right, so we'll go ahead and continue on here. Um, as we mentioned before, we like data, and there is a large host of data that can be considered in the energy industry altogether with this type of modeling. Because of that, we aim fundamentally to be very transparent with what goes into this model. We do that for two reasons. One, um, with a study, once it's published, we want people to be able to reference and see exactly what went in and shaped wisdom and the outputs that it provided. But two, um, we are able to share that with the client that we're working with and with their expertise, they're able to come in with that eye and look at how we're handling things essentially. And in addition to that, they can actually change and adapt and update the inputs that we are using. That's key because then um, we can customize the model specifically uh, for the project at hand. We aim to keep our data sets as customizable and adaptable as possible, not just for the client input and the client ability to update our data, but also just to easily incorporate new sources of information. This grid is changing rapidly all the time. And so as an example, at the end of 2020 with the spending bill that went through, uh, the offshore wind got a new ITC. We want to be there to be able to handle that going forward. By default, we provide all of these data sets, and as such, we want to make sure they're regularly maintained and updated. Again, the grid is always changing. That's a big source of our work as well. So I could spend a very long time talking about all the data sets that go into this model. So unfortunately, I have to pull back a little bit and just talk some high levels. Um, but this gives an idea of the general, the largest data sets that tend to go into wisdom. Um, for starters, the demand profiles and the demands altogether. What and when does wisdom need to, or yeah, what and when does wisdom need to satisfy this demand? In addition, we have our potential and resources information, which actually tells us where certain um, new builds can go. As an example, if we see a wind farm built in the Cuyahoga National Park in Ohio, that, that's just not good. Um, so we're very stringent on knowing where uh, certain resources can be built as things are built out into the future. 
We provide the existing generation and transmission. What's out there already? What does wisdom not have to build potentially? What will it have to weigh out going forward in time? Policy legislation and mandates. The RPS and with all its carve outs will be um, heavily, well, will be set in these base cases and then most likely going forward with the sensitivities as well, or depending on the sensitivities, we'll, we'll see how that goes. But specifically for Maryland, that will be in this model to help set what wisdom does and define what it needs to meet by certain times. There may be additional policy and legislation mandates that are tested or come into play as well, but we'll be working with Rebecca and Kevin to, to define that. The climate data, I'm not going to touch so much on because Aditya will spend some time there. Um, but the standard inputs, I put this quote unquote standard simply because um, it's a bucket for everything else um, in addition to what I described. And there's actually a lot that's in there. Just to give you an idea, capital costs, uh, variable costs, fixed costs of the gener generator technologies that uh, we're modeling. What generator technologies are going to be in this model run? What are the fuel cost curves that we expect to see, say, for natural gas? What's the lifetime of a wind wind plant? So on and so forth. All of these things are set to define, constrain, and set the baseline for the scenarios that wisdom will run. So as I mentioned before, the weather data sets that we produce really are fundamental to wisdom altogether. We rely heavily on the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, um, which produces the HER model, the high resolution rapid refresh, throwing a few acronyms your way. And we use that um, as our input weather data. And that provides us a granularity that's five minutely, but also three kilometer resolution across the US. And you can see that grid here and what that looks like. We spend a lot of time bringing any type of spatial data into our model to relate it to this grid. That means that um, that things can be tied innately to weather, again, because weather has such an impact on so many pieces of what is modeled. As an example of one of the data sets that is tied to the weather data inherently is our input generator data set. I'm going to show you an example here for PJM. By default, we use the EIA 860 generators, um, the generator data sets. Put a pin in that for now, just for Maryland. I'll touch a little bit more on that momentarily. But um, we take that data in, we put it into our technology buckets that are defined for the model runs, and then we tie it to a three kilometer grid cell from the her grid. So, as you can imagine, a wind farm comes in and we're able to map it to our, our weather data inherently. But the same goes for, for more than just variable energy. Weather is, is very important for many aspects. As a part of the process that we go through, we do analyze some of um, the high levels just to just to talk about what we've seen so far, just going through PJM. Um, we see a lot of solar tends to be built along the eastern seaboard. That's the red dots that you see there. Um, a good amount of coal is up and down the Ohio River. Those are the black circles. Uh, green uh, is wind, and you can see a good amount of that in northern Illinois and along the western portions of the Appalachian Mountains there. Uh, nuclear is prominent in northern Illinois as well as northern Ohio. Um, natural gas, oh, sorry, nuclear is the purple. Natural gas, the gray, is also quite prominent in northern Illinois. So those are just some high levels of what we see when we go through initial um, processing of all, all of all of our projects. Now, for Maryland in particular, we are starting again with the EIA 60 data. This data set handles fairly well um, the utility scale generation that is out there. It doesn't handle so much the distributed resources that are out there. And so for this study in particular, we're going to be using the PJM GATS data for Maryland. Um, that's generator registration that's used more in line with RECs for within PJM, but it has um, metadata for uh, distributed resources. In particular, this will make a big difference for distributed solar as there'll be a good amount of capacity coming in from that in the model for Maryland. The reason for this work in particular is one, again, uh, pointing out the customization that we're able to do for studies like this, but two, um, to show, uh, uh, um, uh, to, to make sure that the RPS carve outs are handled appropriately going through all of these scenarios. Just to give you an idea of what our weather data actually looks like, a lot of times we get asked, what capacity factor do you use for wind or solar? 
And the answer is it's not singular, it's plural. We have this data both spatially and temporally in, in our model. And that makes a big difference as to how these get deployed. We create wind power capacity factors and solar power capacity factors for several technologies. For wind, 80 meters up to 200 meter hub height. For solar, say Axis One, bifacial panels evil, yeah. even, rooftop solar. Taking a look at the left panel here, this is the average wind power capacity factor at 100 meters across the PJM footprint. If you look at Illinois, Northern Illinois sees some higher winds. So does Northern Ohio pockets along the Appalachian mountains. And then again, along the Eastern seaboard and offshore. On the right hand side, the solar, this is AC power, power capacity factors here is much more uniform across the footprint, but you do see um, areas that jump out Northern Illinois again, along the Appalachian mountains and again, along the Eastern seaboard there. I alluded to this previously, but this is a look at our potential data set, meaning where can we actually cite new variable generation? In particular, we use the USGS land use applications heavily for this. And so we remove military sites, land that is two slopes, protected national parks, so on and so forth. It, the list is quite long. I just wanted to provide a few examples here. The upper left hand shows onshore wind potential. The upper right shows offshore wind potential for PJM. The lower left shows DPV, I'm sorry, uh, distributed solar potential across the footprint. And the lower right shows utility solar across the footprint. You can see right away that rooftop solar potential is higher where there is more buildings, which is where higher population centers are. Offshore is actually pretty prominent for, for PJM as a whole, both in the Atlantic and in the Great Lakes there. For onshore wind and utility solar, we see that there's higher pockets um, of build available across Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio, but there's definitely a sputtering of other areas across the PJM footprint, including Maryland as well. The last data set I'll talk about today that goes into wisdom is our load data set. We do create this by default for VCE or uh, here at VCE, both for a BAU scenario. Um, business as usual, and then a high electrification scenario. But this data set can be customized and updated by the client. And for this Maryland study, um, we have been in contact with E3 and um, MDE who worked previously on the Greenhouse Gas Emissions Reduction Act, um, GGRA plan study. There were loads that were used in there that we would like to use here simply because they're known, they're vetted. Um, we're working currently to make sure that that data can be, be provided to us at a granularity that works in our model as well. Um, but just to give you a quick gut check of what we do and how we do create these things in particular is um, this table here, I show you the total business as usual loads for VCE, that's on the right hand side. And then I compared it to the reference scenario gen, uh, generation uh, load, sorry, <laughs> load from the GGRA study. And you can see that there's significant parity between the two. So just to note that at the end of the day, whichever we use for at least the initial cases, um, wouldn't be drastically different, but we are aiming to use loads that um, I imagine many of the group have seen before. With that, I hand the baton back to uh, Aditya, but perhaps if there's any burning questions in the meantime, uh, maybe we can answer a few now. Hi, this is Janet Christensen Lewis. I, I put up my hand. Sorry, you didn't see it. Oh, um, yeah, sorry. If you go back to, that's okay. If you go back to slide 26 and you talk about your potential modeling data and what, mm -hmm. where you would remove places, um, what, I know you said that it was long and you didn't put it all on here, but what kinds of things do you include in there? Do you include things like prime agricultural land, um, green infrastructure land, forests, uh, other things besides what you've mentioned here that are uh, particularly important to different areas? Sure, sure. I think fundamentally the higher levels are things that are preserved or removed, anything that has high population for say like the wind and the solar. Um, are removed that need a certain amount of space, uh, so on and so forth. I do have a more extensive list that I can follow up with you on. Um, 
post this call if that works. But uh, Aditya, is there anything else maybe you want to add there too? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's basically, uh, we just uh, make the uh, make sure the model has all the setbacks required from high population mm -hmm. areas. If mm -hmm. the land is uh, too sloped, uh, that's taken out military bases, uh, national parks, etc. So, uh, radar uh, areas which are deemed important for radar coverage and that, that would interfere with them, those are removed. Uh, so, anything, uh, so basically, we are quite conservative about what is left in there. Uh, mm -hmm. so. So, this is Fred. Uh, I guess uh, follow up on that. Is there anything in, in that's removed that's particular to Maryland, or is this just a broader level review? Uh, you know, military sites cover all states and in, in, in these circumstances, but anything uh, in here that's particular to Maryland? So, right now, this is just a broader level view of all states. Um, if there's anything in particular that does need to be considered for Maryland, we can aim to incorporate it for this study as well. No, I would and also share what's there in particular in greater detail right now. It's just a spatial map. <laughs> I was particularly interested in uh, local zoning regulations, et cetera. Does that include it? It, it would be included more so in the setbacks from um, population centers that we we re we remove and um, yeah. So you do you do look at local zoning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I see a few more questions coming in. Uh, so, yeah, so Julian Silk is asking whether there's an option to consider the impact of drought on hydroelectric production. Uh, and that's yes. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit in the climate, but just to give you a quick answer, uh, precipitation is uh, one of the inputs the model takes into account. So, uh, for years that we see lower than average precipitation that changes the capacity factors that hydro production, uh, hydroelectric production can uh, work at. So, uh, so that's how we uh, incorporate that. Mm -hmm. And we also use annual profiles of what we've seen historically from hydroelectric production across the US. And that will also inherently bring in um, real time or what was experienced on the grid essentially as well in terms of the hydro performance. Um, can I ask another question related, I think, to, to Janet's earlier question about the land uses? Um, my name is Jen Ayosa. I'm with Baltimore County. Um, there's been a lots of conversations across Maryland over the years about. Uh, I think we lost you, Jennifer. Yeah, I don't hear anything. Something that this group could um, advise or ask to be considered that in determining um, the potential for some of these um, energy resources, we were to say, um, avoid intact forests or avoid other natural resources or avoid prime farmland or, or other um, land uses that may be deemed of particular value so that we're we're looking at the consequences of setting up a, a, a scenario of winners and losers. Jen, I do apologize, you broke for part of your, the first part of what you were saying? Uh, I'm sorry about that. Um, I don't know which part you heard. I'm Jen Ayosa with Baltimore County. Mm -hmm. um, we, in Maryland, we often have conversations about sort of um, competing, competing land uses or competing interests. Is mm -hmm. it something that this work group could possibly recommend um, to you as the modelers to look at scenarios where um, perhaps intact forests or other natural resources um, that may show up in, in your 
your basic land use as potential sites for solar or, or other energy generation so that we could have conversations about, um, you know, where we, we do or do not want to see um, energy production. Um, this is Kevin. I'm going to, I'm going to chime in and say, I'm taking a couple of action steps away from this. One is, as some of you know, um, PPRP does have a smart DG um, um, tool up on the website that screens sites for possible wind and solar um, projects uh, based on military, based on forest land, so on and so forth. And there's certainly some overlap between what's in there and what's in DCE's model that we we need to make sure that we're in sync on. Um, second, um, I do want to issue, I mean, what we can do is when um, we can come back and show some of where some of these projects might be cited with maps and so forth, but I, I want to urge some caution here. Again, we're limited on scenarios that we can do. And, and remember, we're looking at more or less the feasibility of doing 100% RPS, 100% clean. Um, you know, the siting challenges or where we want these is a little bit out of scope. And so I do, I do want to urge some caution there. I recognize that's a, a really important and pivotal issue in, in Maryland. Um, but at the end of the day, this, this is what we were charged with doing. And I'll quickly add, uh, I think forest land uh, would probably, it's definitely removed from uh, possible siting. Uh, agricultural land is something uh, you would have to take a look at. But uh, yeah, I think like Kevin said, it's, uh, we can make sure we uh, either uh, match up with uh, the smart TG data set, or basically, if there is uh, anything else, uh, if any data uh, is available from the group, uh, which we can use to ensure sites are removed, we can definitely use that. Yeah, and we can also provide a more complete list of what's removed essentially and what's kept as well. Thank you. Aditya, I was going to ask um, if you could expedite it a little bit because I want to allow some time for questions and I've got a couple slides that sure. um, I have yet to go through. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Definitely. I will go through this uh, quickly. Um, so uh, what I'm going to go through in the next few slides is how the load and climate data set works. Uh, so the load data set in Wisdom P is broadly divided into four categories plus hydrogen production, which comes into uh, play uh, in the high electrification scenarios. The low data set starts from a combination of the FERC 714 and the weather data set. The first step is we take the FERC 714 data set and uh, downscale it from the census level resolution to state level resolution. Next slide, please. Uh, once we have the annual uh, uh, demand data sets, we set it about set about creating profiles of the load. Uh, the space and water heating load depend on uh, weather uh, as to every kind of load. So the space heating load is calculated assuming that the ideal indoor temperature of the building stock is 72 degrees Fahrenheit. And the formula gives you uh, the expected uh, uh, demand based on uh, the weather in that local region. Uh, I'm just showing a couple of examples of California and Maryland. We see that California has uh, sort of a a flatter uh, space heating demand mainly due to its uh, milder climate, whereas in Maryland we see a stark uh, difference between uh, the uh, winter and summer uh, demand for uh, space heating. The water heating is modeled similar to space heating. We just assume that the ideal water temperature in the water heater needs to be 140 degrees Fahrenheit. And on top of this, we uh, overlay the diurnal uh, residential usage uh, over the US. Uh, and we also assume that the incoming water temperature is correlated with the outside air. That's the, that is, the water is cooler in winters compared to summer. So as you can see, in California, we see a sort of a flatter profile, again, due to its milder uh, climate, whereas in Maryland, there is a sharper difference between uh, water heating use in winters versus summers. 
Uh, next slide, please. Next, we can calculate flexibility on these loads. So, for example, with space heating, flexibility is calculated assuming that for short periods, typically four hours, the indoor temperature can be dropped to 68 degrees Fahrenheit. So, using this, the formula uh, shown there can calculate available flexibility in the space heating load. Um, we see that California has a lot of uh, flexibility in its space heating, again, because of its milder climate. Uh, except for that short period in summer where it's zero because there is no space heating load. Uh, whereas in Maryland, there is less flexibility throughout and a bigger uh, chunk of time in the summer where there is no flexibility driven by uh, there being no heating demand. Water heating flexibility is a little bit more complicated. Basically, the model has to ensure that water heating, uh, the water heater demand is satisfied at every time step, but it can flex uh, the load by overheating the water during high supply periods or allowing the temperature in the water heater to drop to a minimum of 120 in high demand periods. Uh, so uh, basically the model uh, uses that uh, tolerance in the water heater temp uh, water temperature in the heater uh, to uh, perform flexibility. Next slide, please. When it comes to transportation, it depends on uh, two parameters. First is the energy used for cabin heating and cooling, which is modeled similar to the space and water heating, and energy used for driving. So to get energy used for driving, we look at uh, driving behavior uh, over the year uh, for various states. We, we get this data from the Department of Transportation. This is combined with the energy efficiency of electric vehicles as a function of ambient temperature. So we see that electric vehicles have performed at their best at around 20 degrees Celsius Fahrenheit, and then the efficiencies drop on either side of that. So using these two profiles, we can calculate total energy used by electric vehicles. But the way the grid sees this is when people plug in their vehicles to charge. And for that, we use the average charging behavior uh, determined by Idaho National Lab study. Uh, and we see that people typically plug in their vehicles between uh, 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. local time. Uh, with the peak charging observed around midnight. So that's how the model sees uh, the electric vehicle load come onto the grid. The plot inset shows there uh, the uh, electric vehicle uh, profiles for uh, California and Maryland, and the red line shows the fractional miles driven. So we see that this is typically correlated with the driving behavior uh, with some impact of uh, ambient weather. Next slide, please. So once you have all the load shapes, uh, you can multiply them with the annual energy use and to get the full load profiles. So here we're showing the BAU uh, loads uh, for the sectors that we uh, model. Um, we see that conventional load is summer peaking as it's driven by industrial use as well as uh, cooling demands. Uh, space and water heating as expected is winter peaking and there is negligible electric uh, transport demand in 2020. Next slide, please. As you move to 2050 uh, in the BAU, you see that the conventional load increases, and that's driven by population growth as well as uh, uh, improving standards of living, people uh, incorporating more appliances, air conditioners, et cetera. Space heating demand increases slightly as, uh, again, driven by population growth. The water heating demand is actually seen to reduce, and that's driven by people uh, installing, uh, replacing their older electric resistive heaters with more efficient uh, resistive heaters or heat pump water heaters, or some migration from electric to natural gas water heating. There is also a marginal increase in electric uh, vehicle use. Next slide, please. Comparing this with the high electrification scenario in 2050, we see that the conventional load doesn't change much uh, due to electrification, and that's mainly driven by energy efficiency measures. Uh, the space heating as well is seen to not change, and that's because the space heating is moved from uh, resistive heating to uh, heat pumps. Uh, and newer heat pumps uh, replace the older ones, so therefore uh, are more efficient and hence do not increase energy use. Water heating as well doesn't change as all resistive and natural gas uh, water heaters are converted to heat pump water heaters. Electric transport sees the largest growth. Um, with a peak load of around 3,500 megawatts uh, around the month of May. Uh, next slide, please. 
We also incorporate dynamic line rating on the transmission as well as losses. Uh, the dynamic line rating is calculated assuming that transmission lines are designed for based on the local uh, weather and climate. Uh, once we have, have the average uh, design from that, we can figure out the additional ampacity that can be squeezed through these lines depending on local weather. And for example, we see in the Midwest region, uh, there is a higher potential for increasing transmission line ratings due to the colder winters, as well as the higher wind speeds in these regions. Whereas in the Southeast US, there is lower potential for increasing line ratings, mainly because of warmer temperatures, as well as lower wind speeds. Next slide, please. Finally, talking about climate. Uh, climate Sorry, impact I did yet. Yep. If I can interrupt, this is Joey from the Maryland PSC. A question at the, can you back up one slide to the transmission line? Yes. Rating and losses. Yes. Does that take into consideration any of uh, PJM's um, transmission planning? Uh, sorry, I uh, don't know what you mean by that. So, um, yeah, so the, the transmission planning at, at the regional level, PJM's regional level, um, as far as going to, you know, uh, ensuring reliability of the grid and to the extent that there are uh, projects that are looking to increase the efficiency of the transmission or the bulk power grid in general might impact some of your modeling when it comes to, you know, losses. Okay, uh, that's a good question. So uh, the way we determine the average line ratings is uh, we use the IEEE uh, standard for that. Uh, so based on that, we uh, determine the uh, average line rating that's uh, typically in the standards and then based on that then uh, we figure out uh, what additional line rating that we can add so it is not fine-tuned for pgm specifically it is a more general methodology that we use um, so uh, what pgm is doing might uh, already you know have some of this included in that okay but we ensure that we don't uh, exceed any of the design constraints, for example, the core temperatures or the film temperatures on these lines, we ensure all that all those design constraints are met at all times. Uh, this is Fred from uh, PPRP, uh, but what does the model consider the expansion of the transmission system? I mean, PJM has a plan for expanding uh, into the future. How does the model um, adjust for that? Yes, the model explicitly models transmission down to 69 kilovolts. So basically, uh, the uh, new transmission lines, which the model builds, uh, will again be designed uh, based on the average uh, IEEE criteria and then have this uh, dynamic line rating available on top of them. So any transmission that whether it's existing or new built by the model uh, will be treated, uh, will be given the same uh, treatment. Thank you. So I, I, this is Kevin. I, I sort of feel like we might be talking past each other um, and Joey and Fred let me know if I'm off base here, but I, I, what I think I hear you're asking is, are we going to be incorporating, you know, the latest PJM transmission <laughs> planned upgrades from say the RTEP process? Is that the question you were trying, you were asking, or did I totally misinterpret that? No, that, that is my interest. Um, I see the word. Yes. Okay. So, so the answer is yes, we are going to, we are going to do that. Yeah, sorry, I misunderstood your question. Thanks, Kevin. That was in part my question as well. L let me let me follow up if I may, DTA, uh, DTA yep. excuse me. Um, so I would say it would be the baseline upgrades in the RTEP, not any of the, if you will, the economic efficiency sort of upgrades that might get identified. Um, is that a reasonable assumption to go with? I'm actually asking that as a question. Um, yes, this I think more, so. I'm sorry, it's more for Joey and Fred. I, I apologize to DTF. No, I think, uh, you know, whatever is uh, reasonable. I just, my, my question was just out of, you know, how does, how does the model or forecasting it just more general? How does it accommodate? expansion of a transmission system in general? Uh, is it just sort of like an incremental increase, uh, you know, such as like population might increase across 10, 20 years? Um, but but certainly there would be more specificity tied with a uh, the RTEP, uh, what is foreseeable 
I imagine the uh, the model would be adept at responding to that. But just sort of uh, more of a broader timeline. How would how would the model or how would modeling adjust to that? And my question goes to the more granular, pulling the information directly, knowing knowing and understanding what's actually planned at the PJM region at the broader regional level, accounting for that. Um, yeah, whether or not that it would include market efficiency projects, you know, arguably you could, you could, you could say yes or no. Um, but yeah, the, I, I was curious to see how, how in the grander scheme of things, the model would incorporate transmission buildouts. Um, because we are talking about, I mean, yes, we, we have a very state specific goal and we're looking at that, but at the same time, we are part and connected to a much broader bulk power grid and you know, where our electrons come from, I mean, it all relates to the lines that carry them. Right. Um, absolutely. So, uh, so it's yes and yes. So uh, the model can definitely incorporate any planned uh, transmission uh, plates, uh, which can be uh, put uh, hard coded into the model that the model has to build those if those are already decided. Uh, but apart from that, uh, in its default state, the model is evaluating uh, transmission against local generation. So the model is evaluating at every time step and every investment period whether it makes sense to build generation closer to the load uh, and hence uh, forfeit the cost of transmission lines, losses, etc., or build it in a more optimal location in terms of capacity factors and then pay for that uh, transmission line and uh, uh, get those uh, losses along the way. So the model is being co-optimizing, uh, taking into account all these impacts and then deciding, okay, do I need to build more transmission or not? And then every new transmission is modeled as a new build uh, just to be conservative. So even if it is uh, an upgrade to an existing line, it is just the costs are modeled as new builds. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so I'll just quickly finish up the climate uh, slides and then can answer any more questions. Uh, so climate impacts every aspect of the energy grid and therefore we do account for it and uh, its impacts on every aspect within the model. Uh, climate impacts will be turned off in the reference scenario, uh, and then they can possibly be turned on uh, for any of the sensitivities that we do. Uh, climate data impacts uh, variable renewable generation, both wind and solar, the heat rates for conventional generators, thermal generators, uh, on the infrastructure such as transmission line and losses, as well as on the demands. So these four panels uh, at the top. Uh, show the impact of climate on wind power production in the various climate scenarios, while the bottom four panels show the impact of climate on solar generation in the various climate scenarios. Next slide, uh, we show some average impacts of climate on the various uh, model variables. Uh, for example, space heating is, uh, as might be expected, will reduce because of the warming climate uh, by as much as 8% on average over the nation. Uh, water heating demand also reduces, but only by 3%. Uh, space cooling, uh, as you would expect, that demand goes up due to the warming climate as much as 15% on average over the nation. Uh, the heat rates as well go up because the higher ambient temperatures reduce uh, efficiencies of thermal generators. And we see heat rates increase by as much as 25 to 3%, depending on the climate scenario. Precipitation is seen to be more lumpy where we have above average precipitation periods followed by below average precipitation periods. And what that impacts is thermal generators as well as hydro, um, uh, the water avail availability for these generators, and that impacts the capacity factors at which they can operate at. So that's uh, the end of the slides we have. So I would like to hand it back to Kevin and Rebecca, um, it, uh, and then I would be happy to answer any questions. Any additional questions um, while we're doing the handoff? Okay, we're getting in the home stretch here, folks. I really appreciate everyone taking the time. Um, the discussion's been great. Um, so, I 
I'm going to be kind of going into the assumptions and key inputs uh, that we are going with at the moment. Um, one reason why we wanted to have this meeting is we wanted to run these assumptions by people and get feedback as to whether they're reasonable or not. Uh, again, I stress this will not be your only opportunity. We are taking written comments uh, until September 8th. We'll cover that uh, towards the end of the presentation. But um, I will go through these somewhat slowly and I'll invite people to chime in uh, as I do it. So please, next slide. So this is the, um, I mentioned earlier that uh, I would show you a slide on the levels of the RPS and the clean energy, clean and renewable energy standard that we'll be looking at. Um, this is as the RPS now stands in Maryland, uh, 50% by 2030. Um, you'll note here on the um, fourth column over offshore wind is put in megawatts uh, rather than percentages. We know that the commission um, will be, or is required to set a percentage level uh, at some point. Um, but uh, subject to um, an additional 400 megawatts in 2026, another 820, well, uh, sorry, 400 megawatts in 2026, 800 in 2028, and 1200 in 2030. Um, we're assuming US wind comes online in 2024, that's 270, and then 120 megawatt skipjack project would come online in 2026. Um, the model itself can calculate the uh, the percentage levels that that the, that capacity would um, contribute. Um, but of course, if the commission weighs in with its own uh, percentage standard or requirement, um, we can put that in as well. Um, any questions before I move on? Hey, Kevin, uh, this is Chris with uh, Brookfield. How are you? Hey, Chris, good to hear from you. Yeah, good to hear from you. I just wanted to confirm. Well, it's more, I just wanted to make sure that you are capturing it correctly. It's, um, it's actually 52 and a half percent. The, the tier 2 is not underneath the actual 50%. So just making sure that. Yeah, that's I'm really glad you brought this up, Chris, because I got wrapped around the axle on that. Well, um, I'm happy to answer it for you. <laughs> Yeah, I okay. I interpret it the other way. I interpret it as the, the two and a half would come out of the overall fifty percent requirement. Yeah, um, I assure you. I wasn't sure. Yeah, I assure you that the that tier two would not have passed this this past session, if if that was the case. <laughs> yeah. So okay. and I'm sure there there are people on the call that will also confirm that, but that's um that's that's how it's written. Okay. Do other people on the call have that same understanding? Because I, I I interpreted it the other way, but I will be the first to admit um, I'm no I'm no legislative attorney. This is Andrew John with American Clean Power. Yeah, um, that's how I understand it. As Chris laid it out. Okay, we'll make that fixed. Thanks. Thanks for pointing that out, you guys. Um, next slide. Uh, all right, so I mentioned earlier that we would kind of do what I would call a glide path between for for the 100% re RPS part of the study, we would do sort of a glide path between 50% and 100% between 2030 and 2040, uh, where we'd be raised the requirement um, by 5% each year. Um, we held the other uh, carve outs constant. Um, not sure if that's a reasonable assumption or not. I'm, I invite feedback on that. But that's our thinking at the moment. Okay, moving on. Um, right, this is what's spelled out as I understand it in the 100% Clean and Renewable Energy Act that was proposed in the past two Maryland General Assembly sessions. Again, the offshore wind megawatts, uh, as, as I described earlier. Um, any questions on this slide or corrections as the case may be? Okay. 
All right, so these are some of the assumptions we're, we're going, well, the assumptions we're going with. Um, we mentioned earlier that we were working with MBE and E3 to see if we can get data from the Greenhouse Gas Recovery Act plan. And, um, and I wanna thank the MDE folks for, for helping us with that. So it looks like we are gonna be able to access the, um, the low data from the Greenhouse Gas Recovery Act um, and um, plan. Um, and as Brianna pointed out, it's pretty close to what VCE has at default anyway. Um, the locational multipliers, um, this is what's in VCE's model. Um, I invite Aditi and Brianna to correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is, is that locations can have a, if you will, locational penalty uh, apply depending on the capital cost or depending on the difficulty in citing the project. Um, uh, Julian, I'll get to your Calvert Cliffs point in just a moment. Um, fuel costs were using the AEO 2021, um, which is at uh, $2.92 million BTU in 2040. Um, yes, I realize that is below what the market is currently. Um, I did look at EAA's short-term energy outlook um, forecasts as of about a week or two ago, and they were their, their long-range forecast is, if I remember right, three dollars and eight cents per million BTU, so not a whole lot different. Um, so that's what we're working with at the moment. Any uh, questions from the group? Okay, moving on. Uh, so these capital costs are all from a report, um, uh, except as noted, from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory's annual technology baseline. Um, and we use the mid-range numbers for that. Um, those numbers are specified there. I won't go through these in detail. Um, we do have numbers for some of, for some of the advanced technologies. Um, uh, Alex, I'll get right back to you. Um, but these will be used in the 100% clean scenario, not in either the reference case or the 100% RPS scenario. Um, we had a question even before the call about how storage works in the model. Actually, Julian, I think that was from you. Um, uh, Aditi or Brianna, do you mind explaining how storage works in your model? Aditi, I think you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I can hear, but I can read. You can add if I miss anything. Sure, sure. Um, so, uh, storage is, uh, uh, in terms of uh, the model, the model uh, uh, separately optimizes the storage for uh its uh, capacity as well as uh, energy. Uh, we model uh, both uh, all the round trip losses, basically while charging and discharging, as well as self discharge. Uh, so, uh, the model basically the uh, model op co optimizes uh, based on uh, what is building, uh, what kind of storage capacity versus energy it would need to ensure that uh, uh, either. Uh, peak demand or periods of long lulls uh, in the variable renewable energy uh, can be met. Mm -hmm. And I'll add to that, and the way the NREL ATB numbers provide the storage costs, again, as Adish just said, broken out between the power and energy um, uh, capabilities of this technology, uh, we don't assume a duration that way. We let the model decide on that, which durations work best throughout the scenarios. You know, further comments, and I'm going to go ahead and move on. Um, I, I had a, this is Alex Pavlik. I had a, uh, a question here. Uh, the, you, you mentioned using the NREL ATB database as opposed to VCE. It was saying you were using the EIA database for uh, cost, uh, capital cost numbers. Is there a reason for this? I, I found NREL tends to be, uh, more optimistic on a lot of these costs than uh, EIA. 
and uh, I was wondering why ATB. What what's what's the balance here? Uh, well, the EIA number I was referencing is the fuel cost number. Um, the ATB numbers. It's funny you said that you found them optimistic. I've heard the opposite, honestly. Oh. Um, so I I kind of don't know. You know. I, I, so I'm, I'm kind of not sure really what to do with that, honestly. Um, they know that they are what they are. Um, but we are using what we, you know, the mid range, they have a low cost range and they have a higher cost. And my understanding, and BCE folks can correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that DC, the higher cost range numbers are, are pretty out of market, if that makes sense. It doesn't, doesn't really connect to what's out there. Exactly. And okay. sorry, go ahead. Yeah. I, I was just going to add um, that in in that line, I've actually had to use the uh, EIA numbers in place of ATB for another study that we did at some point. And this was back, I think, on uh, 2018 data. So it could have certainly changed since then. But I did see those costs not drastically different. There were some differences for sure, but um, for the technologies as we looked at them, um, they were in the ballpark of each other. So okay, um, okay, mm -hmm. fine, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, and then Shannon asked, which costing are you using from the NREL report? So, um, if I understand your question, Janet, um, it's almost all of it's really from the annual ATV report, annual technology baseline report. Um, my, uh, these are uh, national level numbers, so they're not Maryland specific numbers. Um, um, Kevin, it, I can clarify. I okay, know please. Pretty vague, and, and this is for my, I'm just trying to look at it to understand it. Um, they had, for instance, for, uh, Wind and solar, they had capex and they had overnight costs, and they were different depending, um, actually, and also depending on which division you happen to be in. I assume that Maryland is in the two, three, four. Is that correct? And wind is down there too. I mean, they're not in that classification system. The classification systems are like one through ten or something. With ten, I assume being associated with, I don't know, offshore. I don't know. That's so, what I'm. I'm asking. This is actually a curiosity question. Sure, I, I can actually provide a little bit of insight into that. Um, some of it I would have to actually go in to remind myself. Um, but uh, we do assume a certain class. For some of those like onshore wind and such like that, I can pull that out. Um, I don't remember it off the top of my head, but we were aiming for a middle range um, type of class there. And I can pull from the NREL ATB documentation what that is in particular as well, um, just to provide that to the group and they have that information. I know with solar in particular, there isn't actually any variation between what they provide for certain aspects of that. Um, we do pull the overnight capital costs. That's what we end up using in our model, along with the fixed and variable costs that you see in the tabs that are provided by the NREL ATB um, uh, spreadsheets. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Janet. Um, okay, I'm going to skip over the financial assumptions for now. Um, we're assuming we're going to meet the requirements of the RPS or the or the CARES Act. There will be no payments of, of a talk. There will be no ACP payments or alternative compliance payments. Um, let's see. We need to skip ahead at least one slide. All right, skip ahead again. Okay. Um, existing environmental regulations from EPA are in the model. Um, um, we are assuming that the Greenhouse Gas Recovery Act, 40% reductions in greenhouse gas emissions for 2006 levels by 2030 is not a binding constraint. I um, wanted to ask the MDE folks for their thoughts on that, if they're still on. Uh, this is Chris from from MDE. Um, I 
I, I would, I would, it's important to point out that the, the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Act calls for a minimum of 40% reduction by 2030. And the plan that the MD submitted uh, uh, gets a 50% reduction, not accounting for any federal support. So I would, I'd be more inclined to change that to a 50% reduction in GHG from 2006 levels by 2030. Which is consistent with other other inputs that we've done for other similar analyses, like Reggie program review, for example. Okay. Uh, any other comments from the group on that? Uh, Brianna or Aditya, is that something we can do in the model? I mean, can we represent that in the model as a binding constraint, if you will? Absolutely. Okay. All right, I'm going to move on to the next slide then. Okay, so as was described by VCE earlier, the capacity factors are determined in the model based on the NOAA weather data um, at these resolutions specified here. These are the average capacity factors for winds or on that the model comes out with in both PGM and Maryland. Um, similar sort of uh, approach with the utility scale community and residential PV. Any comments on either of those? Okay. Um, so all planned retirements and plants in operation uh, will be in the model. So this will include, for example, uh, Morgantown's recent announcement that the Morgantown coal plant will retire in 2022, uh, June 2022, uh, earlier than expected or projected. Um, and then if we can go on to the next slide, I can answer the Calvert Cliffs question, which I think is on the next slide. Yes. So when the model runs, it will determine if Calvert Cliffs should be relicensed re or not. When their particular license comes up in 2034 for unit one and 2037 for unit two. Uh, regardless of uh, you know, what the model comes back with, we will almost certainly do a sensitivity on the alternative. So if the model says it's not economic to relicense Calvert Cliffs, we'll look at uh, requiring it, the model relicense Calvert Cliffs or vice versa. Uh, we already talked a little bit about the transmission infrastructure. Any comments in particular on Calvert Cliffs? Um, could I make just one uh, comment real quickly here? Please. I'd like to know what percentage of the energy Calvert Cliffs is going to supply in this glide path that y'all are talking about. It's not so much that it's relicensed, it's going to be relicensed anyway, but it's just whether they supply 10% or 5% or no percent. Uh, that's what I'm interested in. Well, I mean, we're not going to know until we run the model, right? Um, we're not, we're not going to sort of say up front what that's going to be. Um, no, but you have already run this reference case, and I'm just wondering what shows up in that. We haven't run the reference case. We haven't run any of these cases yet. Um, so, um, so you know, we would run the model. And if the model says it's economic to relicense Calvert Cliffs, then it'll be relicensed in the model. If it model says it's not economic, then it'll be retired. Um, and we do a sensitivity on whatever the opposite of what the model finds is. Kevin, uh, th this is Alex here. Um, we're in, in terms of basic feasibility, I think we're not giving enough attention to uh, nuclear power. The, the rest of the world is marching ahead on this thing much more quickly than the US is. Mm -hmm. And uh, China, for example, is prototyping uh, small modular reactors to replace the as a heat source for their coal plants. Mm -hmm. In other words, they convert a uh, coal plant to a nuclear plant just by swapping out the furnace for a small modular reactor. And uh, they 
you know, that approach is, uh, you know, it's all standardized. They could clean up their act in 10 years if they really wanted to. Uh, you need a 100% uh, small modular reactor scenario in here just to look at uh, the, uh, the basic feasibility of this. Uh, uh, Maryland should be considering piloting some uh, SMR uh, demonstrations. Uh, it, uh, it, there's, uh, the innovation potential here is uh, largely untapped. Uh, you, uh, the, the nuclear plants are very dependable. You don't need the long tr tr distance transmission. It's a lot cheaper to incorporate storage into the power cycle of a nuclear reactor than it is to uh, uh, build it separately. And China's doing these things. There's a lot of data internationally on costs. Uh, right now, the U.S. doesn't have a nuclear industry. There's uh, no workforce, no uh, supply chains, uh, no experienced uh, project managers or regulators. So, yeah, you're going to you're going to have first mover cost overcome here. But uh, if you use the international numbers, uh, nuclear power looks to be much more powerful than what's presented here. Uh, you need a 100% nuclear scenario with uh, small modular reactors, and some of the scenarios are very compatible with uh, intermittent generators, like uh, uh, SMR uh, generators, very compatible with rooftop solar, distributed solar. Uh, you can actually reduce the transmission required in the uh, uh, in the uh, distribution system by uh, uh, locally deploying these things. Uh, put them on uh, military sites. The uh, uh, military is looking for uh, to would like to be uh, independent of civilian electric power, and there's an opportunity there to pilot some of these SMRs. So, at the very least, you need to start. I, I think you need to think about a uh, 100 100 percent SMR scenario using international numbers for uh, costs to see how that compares with uh, some of the other scenarios you're looking at. Uh, I think that's embedded in the uh, uh, in the CARES bill definition of clean. Uh, right now, this is, uh, it looks like it's, uh, uh, it, it, you know, it's just being short shifted. Uh, well, we are running 100% CARES uh, scenario as one of the first three initial runs. Uh, SMRs are a technology that's eligible to uh, in the CARES Act, so it will certainly be in the model. Um, I would suggest let's let's run that model, see what the results come back, and then uh, when we all get together again to discuss sensitivities, we could we can talk about an all nuclear scenario. Um, but I'm I'm again going to remind people we only have 20 scenarios. And because we're pairing 100% clean and 100% RPS, it's really only more like 10 if you run those in combination. So um, I will be pretty frugal on, on the number of scenarios only because I have to be. Um, so um, anyway, I just kind of want to make that, that general point. Um, and we can see how the 100% uh, Clean energy model run. How you know what comes out of that? Oh, Kevin, this is Janet Christensen Lewis. I just yeah. wanted to make a statement on something you said earlier. Sure. You know, when we're looking at all these models and we're looking at theories about what the future is going to look like, there's so many things that are feasible, but their actual implementation in the future may not be quite as rosy as what the model points out. So. You know, looking at things that could get in the way of your feasibility, whether it's uh, nuclear, whether it whatever, whether it's land use, whatever. Um, I think it would be a little short-sighted not to have some sort of input into uh, looking at those things. Um, you start getting pushback, and you can't get you can't get the energy into the into the uh, mix of things because there's too much pushback on where it's going to be located, I think would be one of the things that would impact your feasibility. Thank you. 
Okay. All right, so in the interest of time, I'm gonna go ahead and go on to the next slide. And wow, there you go. So Fred, I think we're gonna kick it over to you to talk next steps. Okay, so um, yeah, next steps, next slide, please. So yes, the next step, um, as Kevin had mentioned, we're looking to get the uh, comments in uh, into me by September 8th, uh, provided my contact information at the, the front of this. Uh, so in between now and then, I uh, recommend that you review the uh, presentation again, um, uh, study it in earnest and come up with comments. We've heard a lot of uh, good information. I, I think the interest here is to, yeah, to really get the, uh, the breadth of, of the interests of, you know, what, what we would want to see. Um, but on this first one, I think we're, we're going to be running this base case. So we have to understand that this is just kind of like setting the backdrop on which all the other scenarios will be built. Um, so anyway, so provide comments by September 8th, and as and as we indicated, this is going to go along for some time. So there'll be opportunities to provide you know more expansive thoughts further down. But um, please comment on what you've seen here. Um, thereafter, Exeter VCE going to refine the assumptions for the base case. Um, as Kevin indicated, it's essentially two tracks: the 100% RPS and then the 100% uh, CARES track. Um, and so, um, we'll, uh, yeah, scenarios based on the feedback from the working group. So the, primarily those were the, uh, the comments for that. Uh, and then VC will conduct the, uh, initial model runs. Um, then, then thereafter, uh, we'll, we'll get the information out to the working group, review those results, uh, sometime in October and, uh, and probably solicit another round of comments based on that to start working towards the uh, scenarios, but uh, next slide. Um, okay, so yeah, and then uh, as Rebecca indicated up front, there's an appendix with some information that covers the, um, I guess the legislation of uh, affecting RPS and, and beyond that's attached to this presentation. So if you had any questions, base, basic uh, fundamental questions, regarding uh, um, RPS and uh, what's implemented there, please review that as well. But uh, but otherwise, uh, thank you all for your time. I'll, I'll kick it back over to, to Kevin and Rebecca. Any closing thoughts uh, from you all? Uh, one quick thing, this is Rebecca. Uh, there's some other stuff in the appendix, some additional details about the VCE model as well, I believe. Yeah, I think there's also a link to some of the work they've done elsewhere if people wanted to look at that. Um, if people have any other thoughts or questions, I'm certainly uh, would like to hear them as well. Otherwise, I'll look forward to any written comments you may wish to send in. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and then, um, yeah, we have a little bit of time here. Uh, we could throw it open to any other follow on comments uh, based on this. Um, I imagine we're going to be going forward virtually, uh, at least now until the end of the year, perhaps into the spring, but we will see. <laughs> um, it would be nice to get back into a room with folks and, uh, and have these sort of conversations, but um, I think this works for the time being. Fred, hi, um, it's Joey. I got a question for Kevin. Kevin, can you go to your slide 39? Slide nine, was it? 30, 39. 39, okay. Yeah, I, I got a question about the solar uh, carve out. Was that, is that based on the uh, RPS statute, uh, those numbers? Yes, it's based on the bill that passed the General Assembly recently that uh, adjusted the solar carve out levels. Did I get that? Did I get those numbers wrong? And that, and that's the, that, that's the, Bill, uh, you're, you're, are you referring to the bill from this session or the yes. under CJA? Yes. Uh, the bill from this session. Okay. All right. Just wanted to confirm. Thanks. Sure. Uh, Kevin, a quick question. This is Alex. Uh, did I understand you correctly that you're thinking along the lines of splitting your runs between 100% RPS and 100% CARES? Uh, what, what's the ratio? of your scenarios? Well, it's a bit of a to be determined, um, but you were doing, we're definitely doing the first three. 
Um, so the, in other words, you know, a reference case, a hundred percent clean, hundred percent RPS. Um, after that, we're going to come back to the group with some, um, suggested sensitivity scenarios. Okay. And, okay. Good. Yeah. The reason why I, I, I kind of said the hundred percent RPS and hundred percent clean or I'll use the word length, although I don't think that's quite the right word is if we do a sensitivity, I almost think we have to do the sensitivity for both 100% RPS and, and 100% clean. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why I was saying they're, they're, they're kind of connected, if you will. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Any other questions before we uh, wind up for the day? Um, so with that, then, um, yeah, thank you again all for your time. And uh, as I was reviewing um, over the, the last two hours, I think we got it up to about 38 participants. <laughs> um, so we'll, we'll follow up on the list of who uh, participated throughout the day. I think we're down to 33 now. But um, again, uh, yeah, feel free to reach out to me uh, with any technical questions. And I'll uh, work with uh, the team to to get those answered. Or if anything, uh, you know, overall related to the study, I'll be happy to uh, follow up and, uh, and 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 even discuss directly with you. So, again, thanks everybody for joining, and uh, thanks to Exeter and VCE for the presentation. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye.